No other man's life is so appropriate for the big screen. I mean, probably more so than Jefferson or Adams or any of the other founding fathers. I mean, Payne's life was a complete adventure. It seems that this omission, though, is finally being addressed by <laughs> Karen Thorson. And over the last two decades, Karen has produced an award-winning feature-length documentary on James Baldwin, The Price of the Ticket, and most recently co-produced and directed Joe Papp in Five Acts, which will be appearing, I guess, next year? Well, beginning of this year? <laughs> Wow, great. And now she's here to tell us all about her present work and show us clips from her latest endeavor, The Thomas Paine Project. Thank you. Thank you all for hanging in here. This has been an extraordinary day. I just want to kind of sit back and digest. But here I am, and I thank you, Francis. You put together a wonderful program, and it's really a it's been an inspiration because I feel like I think a lot of the conversations that I've had just during this afternoon, I feel inspired. I want to go out and do. This, is, this has given me the message that Payne gave to all of us. Um, I wish my grandmother could see me now, only because some quirk of history got her to unveil a statue of Thomas Paine in New Rochelle back at the turn of the last century. Yeah, she's, she was pretty old. My generations take their time having kids. Um, my family. She, we've never quite figured out why everyone has been convinced that she is a relative of Thomas Paine because his one child died, his wife died in childbirth. Um, we don't know of any history that his um, sister had children. We haven't quite figured it out, but apparently buried in some family attic, there is some genealogical statements to that effect. Anyway, my grandmother unveiled the statue. I heard about this passed down in the family. And, um, well, who is this guy? Of course, I got hold of Howard Fast, Citizen Payne, <laughs> Citizen Tom Payne. And what a rollicking read. It's exactly right. I thought, ah, oh, this, is, this is a guy I, I can of course, it was full of all of the slanderous, uh, you know, he was a drunk, he was the great unwashed, he was slovenly and, and irresponsible in many ways. It, it, unfortunately, I think Howard Fast's research came from all of the um, astroturfing, right. uh, all of the, the writings that were subsidized in order to blacken his name. They were very effective. They were handed down and most people buy them as, as gospel. So I read all of that, and then I began to hear that there were other ways of looking at pain as well. I thought he was great, but I wanted to explore it more. I also was interested in, and this is a sort of selfish part of my narrative, I, I wanted to prove that maybe he could be my relative. So my first idea was that I would write a, a historical novel about six months in the life of Tom Paine, where he actually had an affair and of course, I'm not going to give away the whole plot, but it was this great story. <laughs> and it, it rendered me a valid descendant of pain. I never quite wrote that. Um, it, at one point, was going to become a screenplay. Life went on, didn't happen. And then somehow, and I was, became a documentary filmmaker. I'm really a storyteller. I started as a, a journalist and a writer and have been a filmmaker for two decades. And um, then the idea, well, maybe, maybe we could do a documentary, but I hate reenact reenactments. Historical reenactments usually look fairly fake. Either they're huge, big budgets that Hollywood does, and then I can get sucked in, maybe. But they're always so clean. They're always, they don't seem to be part of, of real life. And I, I just couldn't quite imagine how to do it. So then, OK, how would you do it? I started thinking. And what I'm going to do today, I absolutely, I've taught occasionally, and I tell young filmmakers, don't do this, and I'm, I'm going to do it. Um, don't show your raw stuff. Don't um, give away, because people will believe that that's what it really will be. And what I have to show you is so not what it will be. But I'll tell you a little bit about the, the thought process that has gone into the making of this, this project. Um, I've always loved writers. I've always loved people who were concerned with social justice. 
I've done a number of biographies, and um, my husband, who's also a filmmaker, has also worked in museum media. And if any of you have been down to Mount Vernon lately, this is just to tell you there is a new education center there, and it's under the sheep meadow, which is very cool because if you see George Washington's mansion on the edge of the Potomac and the sheep meadow is in front of it, when you're up at the mansion and you look back, the view isn't spoiled by some new building. But under the sheep meadow, with a, on the side of a hill, there's a big glass window. They've dug a space for an education center. There are a number of films in there. So my husband has, is the creator guy, creative guy I'm involved with those. So we started talking about how to do pain. And we've come up with this plan to try and do something that is based on our work with PBS and based on our work. I've also worked on some museum films, most recently. Um, the Pilgrim's Story up in uh, Plymouth, Massachusetts. If you happen to d drive through Plymouth, the oldest operating museum in uh, the country is up there and running our little film. And it's really the little museum that could. So <laughs> go see it if you can. So it ranges from this tiny little thing to the big expanse of George Washington. We thought, well, what if we did some kind of traveling exhibit on Thomas Paine at the same time as a documentary film? What Our goal is to get this guy out there. And it's kind of the, op if you were here for when um, Ward Reagan was speaking, Ward Reagan was speaking earlier, he said he came in with, uh, he's going to assume that you know all this stuff about pain. He's going to assume that all of this language is, uh, you're familiar with his writings, his thinking. I'm going to do the opposite. Basically, I would like to speak to the people who didn't even know that uh, they wanted to know about pain. That who maybe do assume all of the worst stuff about them, who are, I'm not going to preach to the converted, although I don't want to alienate the converted. <laughs> and so it's kind of, it's going to be, I don't, sadly, there's not as much room in 90 minutes as people think. So it's going to be feature length, but it's probably going to be a Thomas Paine 101 in some senses. But what I don't want to have are crummy, fake reenactments, I have to find a way to tell the story because there's no archival footage. So I will have a number of historians, including Ward Reagan, who, whom I first heard um, in June on the anniversary of Payne's death when he spoke at the uh, Jefferson Market Library. And he got my attention. I, I hope you agree. He really got my attention. And so we're going to have a bunch of historians who are quite respected group, I must say. I've been very honored in gathering experts who are renowned in their field. They're all going to be sitting down and probably, you'll see an example of one interview I'm going to show you. But Ward is going to be standing. And I have a feeling that he's going to be, you know all those PBS films with experts with lamp shades growing out of their right ear? He, he's, I think, going to speak to people who are either skeptical or younger or uninformed and help reel them in. And what I tend to do in my filmmaking is create a conversation whereby people end up, when you watch it, talking to each other. Basically, I talk to them about what they care about, what I know they have to say, but I ask them all similar questions so that they end up answering in a way that if you then take them and cut them up and rearrange them, they can talk to each other. So you get an on-screen conversation. And in fact, that's what I did with this film, which is James Baldwin, The Price of the Ticket. And it's on PBS pretty often. It was made years ago, but they still show it. And actually, Francis, this is for you. I didn't mail it to you, so I brought it. Thank you. And the experts there speak to each other. And the glorious thing that I had with uh, James Baldwin is that at first, I thought, okay, how am I going to film him? He, was, he, he, he died right at the beginning of our filming. And so I thought, well, I guess I'll have a lot of images of him. Maybe some photographs of, exist of him hunched over a typewriter. And um, maybe there's some, maybe he read something in front of a camera. Cameras weren't as, you know, they weren't everywhere, but they were so. Well, it turns out that James Baldwin was so extraordinarily essential in certain people's lives. People filmed him all over the world. We did research in 15 different countries. We found stuff in a thousand, not a thousand, but loads of languages. 
And we were able to use James Baldwin talking about himself by taking all of this archival footage, we intercut it with the experts talking to each other. So they're all having a conversation. Now that was very cool. So how, how do you do that with Thomas Paine? So this was kind of the, the initial effort. I had to figure out how I personally would like to do that. And so here's, here's what, cut to the chase, what, what we've thought of is, and try to imagine this visually, we're going to start with Thomas Paine in prison and um, imagine black background, window, bars, light coming through, pretty simple, pretty austere, and Thomas Paine in prison doing a little writing. Apparently he was able to get pen and paper and do a little writing in prison and talking to the camera from the point of view of the life he has lived, but with a little bit of an edge because here he is in prison and start his journey there and then gradually perhaps using a younger pain, I haven't decided or not, that or not, um, certainly using what we call um, 18th century witnesses, a few characters, a, a printer, a female tavern keeper, a, a Quaker farm wife, um, individuals, a soldier, probably, possibly an African-American soldier. People who were, well, it's Eric Foner, the historian's phrase, history from below. It's the people whom Payne wrote for. And we want to film them against a black background, in costume, looking uh, real as, we, as real as they can be, talking about just kind of a commentary, but from the common folk point of view, talking about, okay, but you know what, I knew Payne and this is what he was like, or I met him when, or, and just, that'll be the fictional part, but we can draw from letters and diaries and journals and the language that existed at the time. They can talk to Payne in prison and somehow sometimes even remind him or bring him up short. Um, obviously the historians and the experts can do the same. That's the idea, to create a, a conversation. And then to illustrate that, because it gets pretty boring when all you have are talking heads, even if they're standing. And so we've done a little bit of filming, and I'll show you a bit of that, of some people who are, they're reenactors, really. They have their own costumes. They're very lived in. They're really schmutzy. They, these guys are um, purists. They uh, don't allow plastic or electric light or any of these things to come into their environments. And so we did what um, is known as verite, cinema verite filming, where we don't, it's not scripted. It's not acting, except they are reenacting. And we just kind of hung out. So I'll show you a little example of that. So I have an example of, um, the first thing I'll show you is um, you're going to have to do some work, work with me here, because I, I, I hesitate to show such raw stuff. But basically we have a guy who we heard about him. He's um, a Thomas Paine uh, an enthusiast. Well, no, he's an actor, actually. He does Thomas, he's a one-man show, impersonator maybe. <laughs> uh, he probably wouldn't like that. One-man show, I guess. Anyway, he goes, his story is interesting. He's British. He was a Shakespearean actor. He did Richard III. He's, he's done major stuff in England. He fell in love with an American. He came here, um, and he's, his, his wife is a well-known dancer, and um, he supports himself, his end of the family, by going around and doing Thomas Paine or Benjamin Franklin or George Well, He does a whole bunch of them, but Thomas Paine was one of them. So we went down and we filmed his deal. So what you will see, and whether he will remain the older pain in prison or not if, say, Tom Hanks or Matt Damon decides to give us a lot of money <laughs> and says, but you really could use a name actor. Well, back when I was going to do the fictional version of, of uh, Thomas Paine, I thought Malcolm McDowell would have been a great guy. He's, he's older now. <laughs> Time passes. Um, anyway, imagine a window in the background. He's going to be shown against black. There's, we haven't built the set 
of the, the little jail room which was in the Luxembourg prison in Paris, but uh, I imagine that that's how it'll be. So imagine this guy or some well-known actor playing an older Thomas Paine in prison, and the set will be slightly different. And you'll see it intercut in a, it'll give you a hint of what we might do. So um, that's Howard Burnham. And uh, another thing of interest is that he said he knew the accent from East Anglia, where Thetford is. And so this is an accent that Tom Paine probably came with. How much of it he kept, we don't know. Um, the next sequence is um, one of our experts, and we filmed him first only because he happened to be in America. He's from France. He's uh, Professor Bernard Vincent, and he, this is one of his books on pain. He's written a number. He also just finished a book on Lincoln. He's a very, very highly regarded historian in France. And this is the Transatlantic Republican, Thomas Paine and the Age of Revolutions. And so uh, we filmed him. and. It's, it's really unfortunate to show it to you this way because this is not an intercut conversation. This is just taking a few bits and pieces of what he said and um, there's not enough breathing room. There's um, all kinds of, of his English, his French accent. There are things that we would make better and more comprehensible, but it'll give you a little idea of uh, what a pain expert who wasn't here today might have to say. The last piece I will show you is really the most fun I've had lately. Um, you know, the Hudson River, the Palisades, big cliff coming down to the river. Um, most of it relatively inaccessible. There's um, one area where in the Palisades Interstate Park, there back in the 1700s, they had found a, a few little ways to curve a, a wagon road down the cliff. And there's a spit of land there that's pretty flat, but not marshy or flooded. And there, in the old days, back in the 1700s, mid-1700s, the ships would stop with onions or whatever else they had to the produce. There was a farmer's market there. There was a dock master. There was a fee charged. And there was a house built. And it's now known as the Kearney House. And I recommend visiting it because it's part of the state park. It finally was renovated, renovated after centuries of disrepair. It is um, called the Kearney House because Mrs. Kearney was um, a widow and she raised nine children in that house and in order to earn a living she opened up a tavern for the people who came by on their ships and it was a favorite watering hole. And so now they have programs there every so often and you can check out the park website and they tell you, well I checked it out and I was amazed because First of all, they have a Thomas Paine celebration, which is actually a fundraiser for the Thomas Paine Society in Fort Lee, because they're still trying to fund their statue. But they also have these reenactor events. Now, some of them are in, in the 1900s, uh, no, the 1800s, rather, because there's another history that they like to explore, explore there. But they have some, well, they had the 22nd Regiment of the British Redcoats coming. And the way they do it, I, this is all new to me, they have from 8 to 10, the public can come in for free. You can drive down this really windy road and go to this house and visit with these redcoats and they speak to you in their vernacular and they tell you their history and they wear their clothes and no plastic is allowed. But beyond that, I mean, it's totally authentic as, as, as much as you can get in the 21st century. But what is well, a number of things are cool. First of all, they let us come two hours early and stay two hours late. So when the public was there, we weren't filming. But when they were just there on their own being themselves, and why do they do this? They told me about this period high that you get. It's the phrase they use. <laughs> where they actually, you know, if it's authentic enough, they feel as if they've gone back in time. So um, we drive up, park our car, and get all our 21st century gear and we're walking up. There is this house, not only has it been restored, it has no electricity, no running water. It's, it's really the way it was. And when you walk up, the glow from the windows, I never will forget, it's candlelight, it's firelight, that's it. 
in the night. And if you don't turn around and look at Yonkers, it's about seven miles north of the George Washington Bridge. If you only look, the palisades are all dark. There's nothing but this house and the glow from the windows. So anyway, we filmed them doing their stuff. And what was particularly good is that they made their own kind of uh, wassail, uh, sort of a brandy and fruit and different stuff, and drank it. <laughs> And so by between 10 and midnight, it was lots of fun filming. <laughs> I don't know if anybody's seen Barry Lyndon, remember? It wasn't Kubrick's best film, but it had lots of candles. <laughs> it sort of felt like that. And shooting, shooting by candlelight is an interesting challenge. <laughs> but you'll see the results. And in the film, this is edited because we had fun kind of putting it together. There's no real narrative, but you'll see that it's edited. Um, in the film, it will be used probably just a bit of it will be to illustrate nice, fat, comfortable Tory loyalists and redcoats who are so confident, especially, for example, on the night when Washington crossed the Delaware, partying, you know, on Christmas Day or Christmas night, and um, just those rebels. So I would love to hear from you guys. How do you think? This is going to come together. Would this work? Yes? Just a question. This last clip. Um, are these people currently in New York, are they British expats or are they American born? Uh, there were some British there that night, but they are. I think we're done. Um, sorry, I just saw him raise his hand. I didn't know if there were a problem technically. Um, there were some British people there, but largely they are. I talked to them there, everything from history teachers to people who work in the financial well, district. I was afraid that you were going to give, give that answer, but I'm curious then, what's the driving force, what's the motivation? Not, not that there's anything wrong with that, I'm just curious, mentally, what drives them? I have, uh, I have wondered and asked the same in thing. Other words, why don't they choose to be blue coats? Well, that was, I felt, you know what I felt that night? I felt as if I were consorting with the enemy. <laughs> I, I really did. Why did they make that choice? But they really do, especially the guys who work on Wall Street, I guess. They are the ones who buy into, I, it didn't get into the edit. There's one point when we, I'll, I'll answer your question a bit more. But I should say that the guy who said it's a period high when it's really at its best, they love the fraternity, the community. They go out camping under the stars. They live in tents. They do Everything is off. They had some ice cubes, but they, it was in a wooden box, and then the plastic <laughs> container was inside the wooden box. There was not a thing there that was inauthentic. It was pretty impressive, and they pride themselves on that. And they're, yeah, but I mean, you, could, you could be an authentic revolutionary as well. Well, exactly. These guys believe in that particular cause. That's why they chose. They're proud of the 22nd Regiment. Truly. Are they, are they, 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 they support it? Well, they are probably either libertarians or they somehow support a certain world view. They, they identify with that. I mean, I, I have to say I had that feeling. Well, when the war was lost, I mean, there were legions of loyal, loyalist families that moved to Canada. And so there are plenty of people from that lineage that up there. But I didn't think it would be still popular here. It, it's obviously quite popular, and they've been doing this, some of them, for years, and they know each other, they have a long history, and there's some, I don't know that you could tell, it's hard because this footage actually is HD, and it's shown widescreen, and it's not compatible with this, so you don't quite see it in its full glory, but there are some, along with the red coats, there are some green coats, and I never realized, but the American citizens who were loyalists wore green uniforms when they fought our blue coats. So, yes? The dirty little secret is, we came back. In fact, that I would argue we have a British system. We certainly don't have democracy, because democracy was diluted by 90% since 1825. And we're not even a republic, because the people in Congress are not for the public object, but as publica. So what we have is a corporate system, which originated with the East India Company, and uh, to this day, the British Commonwealth does not have a written constitution. Their officers in Canada, New Zealand, swear allegiance to the Queen. As our top leaders swear allegiance to the corporations. So I think that kind of theme, which is what Thomas Paine was very much about, it was constitution versus aristocracy, 
except now the aristocracy works for corporations. Uh, that can be a very powerful message. In the well, I, I was pleased that we were able to capture them enjoying themselves in a way that I imagined they were really doing on uh, you know that Christmas night. Um, one of the things that we did, it didn't make it into this cut, and I don't know whether it'll ever get seen publicly, but I love this moment. Um, at one, they didn't really know why we were there. We didn't tell them. We, we just said we were working on, we did stuff for the History Channel and PBS, and we'd asked permission, and we'd gotten permission, and we were going to be there. They said, fine, come on in. And we were polite and discreet and conversant, so all that. But at one point, I asked a group of them, so anybody have any comments on Thomas Paine? Oh, the rebel scum! <laughs> they, there were quite a few invectives. So I, they stayed in character. Yes? Was the music in the first part that revolutionary Beethoven? <laughs> it was. Yes. <laughs> yes. It was a revolution. Yes, you know, you, you recognize it and you're absolutely right. My husband will be very pleased that you recognized it. And the music in the uh, Kearney house was the, the fiddler, actually. He was, he does that. I think that was very extraordinarily natural looking, by the way, just for, for, it really did feel like, you know, you were... Well, I'm sort of amazed by it because I just this is a part of my personal history, but as a filmmaker, I started out as a journalist and then I got interested in, in filmmaking and you could play with more toys and I still could write, so I was quite happy with that. And I went to work actually with Maisel's films and the Maisel's brothers are known for their documentaries, which they call, call direct cinema, but it's cinema verite. And so what we got I don't think is often gotten. We got cinema verite of the 1700s. So I'm glad, I'm glad you think so. I also think it's truly important. One of the things we want to keep, we've written in our part of, uh, the main part of filmmaking is fundraising, unfortunately. That's why I get excited when we get to do something like this. But I have to write proposals and um, describe the, the film and how it will be, how it will look. And I have to do it on paper. And, so on. But one of the things we say, pain will be off his pedestal and, and the colors will be muted and the, it will, basically it will be dirty and it will be bustling America, a work in progress. It's not going to be all of this, uh, you know, the colors of the monarchy, which is sort of why I got a kick out of putting the historians <coughs> in a slightly burgundy background because it isn't going to be elsewhere. So you can be showing 20th century scenes as well too? No. No, um, I'm going to try and keep it. Um, we filmed at Washington Crossing. They do reenactments in December. We're going to film at Valley Forge. Um, How are you going to incorporate then your historical experts? Are they going to just be off camera and you hear their voices? Just like Bernard Van Al Vincent, the guy who you saw, he will be intercut with Thomas Paine much the same way James Baldwin in the film that we did is intercut, even though he's speaking back in 1960 to experts who were speaking at the end of the 20th century, they can talk on the same topic. And at first, when I did that the first time, I didn't know if it would work, but it does. You can have people talk across centuries if they have something to say to each other. And you can take things and obviously, you know, Nixon's 18 minutes, you can do a lot with scissors. but you can manipulate it in a way so that they say things that, that actually play off each other and it's a, a sometimes a counterpoint. We do have also in the interest of fundraising raising, but in the interest of historical accuracy and I think scholarship, we have people of various political persuasions who are part of film. In fact, Richard Brookheiser, who was mentioned earlier today and is on Moyers with Harvey Kay, who is actually our senior scholar um, on the project. Um, Harvey and Richard will both be on screen and they will be talking about opposing ideas, I hope. And it will be interesting, I hope, for the audience as a result. I'm not sure you understood my question. I'm sorry. One of my graduate degrees is in sociology. There's an entirely different definition of constitution in Britain than there is in the United States. When they talk about the constitution, they're talking about traditions, loyalty, the living constitution, the queen. And this was what Thomas Paine was against. Ever, ever since common sense, he was talking about, you know, if we're going to have a monarchy, let's put the charter on a pedestal and, and go after the charter. And then in 1805, he's still talking about uh, the Constitutional Convention in Pennsylvania. So he was for a written 
constitution, whereas the British ideal of constitution goes back, you know, tradition to a contract like the Magna Carta. So common law. Yeah, are you gonna are you gonna uh, cover that theme because I think this is something really about Thomas Paine that's essential. Yes, we will. One of the things that I'm also tempted to cover related to the Constitution, but I don't know that we will have time to go there, and you'd have to go there very carefully. One of the things, when the gentleman raised the issue of whether or not Thomas Paine is a founding father, and one of the things he didn't do was work on the Constitution, a written Constitution, well, well, but I've read the, the, the sort of uh, theorists of what they've written about Thomas Paine and what he contributed to the Constitution. And there's currently a bunch of people who can feed words into a computer and find out the author by the phrasing and the frequency of words. And it's turning out that Thomas Paine wins hands down in terms of what phrases and, and not just the obvious ones, but turns of phrases, uses of punctuation, stylistic stuff. So I have heard that there was a draft before Jefferson's and that was quietly given to Jefferson. Now, I understand that without, it's just like saying Thomas Paine had to be a Freemason, uh, a Mason. Um, the scholars will tell you appropriately there is no proof of it and therefore we cannot say he ever was. Therefore we must say he wasn't. Well, I, there's a difference to me between saying he wasn't and there is no proof that he was. And, he certainly was friends with everyone who was um, a Mason. He, he was traveling in those circles. So I, I like thinking about those possibilities. Okay, the question is, is if he was intimately involved in fact in writing the Constitution, why did he want attribution? Oh, the same way he didn't want copyright or money. That wasn't his goal. He wanted it out there. And, and at that point, uh, you know, he wasn't necessarily the guy who would be the uh, best one to sell it. I think he was very astute in that way, and he was also very humble, and uh, astoundingly so. He really walked the walk. Mm -hmm. well, you know, he, didn't, no, he didn't write the Constitution. <laughs> he, he, his idea was that we have a... A written Constitution. Yeah, that yes. in common sense. And yes. Was talking about uh, that person in the now, he was hired in, in France uh, yes. to write their constitution. Yes. By the way, he said he wanted to be a holy citizen because they had the second written constitution in the world before France did. Uh, so he didn't write the American constitution, but in, uh, he did propose an idea for the, con for the convention in 1887. That's on the record. Yes. And he was involved in that concept. Very much so, with Lafayette. Sure. Well, no, in France with Lafayette, but I'm saying in the United States, in 1783, he proposed the idea for a constitutional convention because he saw the flaws with the Articles of Confederation. Yes, so and I'm he, sorry, I was conflating the Declaration of Independence right. and the Constitution of all things I cannot do. But yes, you, you're right about that. Oh, I was interested when you said he was humble. Um, a lot of people are going to say he wasn't because he, you know, he had this sort of, uh, he was very proud of what he wrote. And I'm, I'm fascinated to see how you're going to handle the personality aspect. I know what you're talking about, and I think, um, as I was telling my neighbor here, I think Payne was one of the kindest individuals, one-on-one, yeah. um, -on -one to people, and that's completely lost to history. And I, I'm going to be fascinated on how you actually capture the personality, because even the historians get it wrong. They're interested in ideas, and they're, they're you know, so I'll be... Well, part of it is, is I like to tell a story emotionally, so I hope that some of that comes through. And I've found enough in letters and... Um, personal documents, not just the, the obvious publications that lead me to think that Payne had, despite a, a, a almost resentment that he wasn't as recognized as he deserved at the same time, he, he actually was the agent of that. He made that choice. Um, there's some very tender things that he has written. Yes, it is. Why, why would he, you know, it's like going against himself almost, you know, and then he got, then he got, but he got, well, he got the, he got, he got, he got he was, and I think he probably took some pride in that. Again, the but contradiction. That's what I mean. he, well, no matter where you are, he would move to be opposite. Well, he also was beyond the outsider. He was global. He saw beyond. It was what we've heard so much today. When she said that he's like a, considered to be like a universal man, like he thought 
thought of himself as a world. I, yeah, so he said as much. He wrote as much. But there's another thing that... Uh, there's This again is a rumor, and I'll just share it here because I don't know that I'll get it in the film, but I find it fascinating. I don't know if you are familiar with something called the Junius Papers. There were um, letters to the editor, basically. And in those days, it was quite typical to sign with a, a false a name, just like common sense. And non de plume, exactly. And these were written in England, and they were before Thomas Paine wrote um, his tax uh, assessor's uh, plea for better wages and better working conditions. And so people often say that that was his first, the excise man's writing was the first uh, example of Thomas Paine's writing. Well, there's been a big debate of, over the writers, this mystery writer of the two newspapers, writing to a, a newspaper in East Anglia about social injustice, and in particular, often criticizing the um, Earl of Grafton. Now, where does the word graft come from? <laughs> That's it. The Earl of Grafton also, it, I believe, I've, I, I'm, these are all secondary sources. I can't document this. I will only have it in the film if I can have someone who's willing to say it. I won't be the one to say it, but what? No, it's going to be hard to get some. Or if you're talking about the declaration sources of the declaration. I know, but I have. There are publications when you read them. Yeah. When you read the analysis, it's gosh, it's convincing. And, and that writing stopped right at the point that he went. I know. And his his mother was a maid at the Earl of Grafton's, and he got. Um, he was apparently found poaching on the Earl's property and got beaten up. And there are different reasons that he could have been really mad at this guy, not to mention the bigger ideals. And the writing is like pains. And so there are arguments, uh, people who are totally convinced and people who are totally scoff at it. I love exploring that kind of stuff. The only stuff that will get in the film is stuff that I really can support. But I had to tell someone. <laughs> yes. Barbara. Well, as I had said, we were in England uh, this last July, and we were in Lewis, um, and to go to the actual place we went, we stayed at the White Hart, and we were in the room that oh. was an excise oh. officer in, and there were some of the uh, colloquium seminars took place there. We also went to the Bull House, which is where he stayed, and he mar eventually married the daughter of the owner of the Bull House, but to go to these places, which are, they don't look any different. They didn't change them. They, they are authentic, so I know you'll probably have financial constraints, but if you uh, have anything like that in there, it is such verite, it is so amazing. Well, that, see, that is so what I can. hope to do. I've, I've written nice big budgets. Yeah. <laughs> but we do, I must say, just in terms of, of the fundraising, it's, it's an interesting process. I've been through it more than once, but uh, we got our first grant from the Massachusetts Foundation for the Humanities. It's extremely courageous for a granting organization to be the first money in. They have to really believe, but they, their philosophy is to pick what they believe in. And then our, our second big grant came from the National Endowment for the Humanities, and we were the only ones to receive a planning grant in 2008 in the nation. And that was pretty big. And then we got a, designated a We the People project, which is a national um, category of, of projects that are approved and I wonder how J. Ward Reagan gets approved by the NEH when he is so radical and so wonderful in what he has to say and I think, do they know what they've got? <laughs> well, they approved us. Do they know what they've got? <laughs> yes? You can get away in this particular period and with him of speaking to the camera, to the people, because they sensed their destiny and their, their desire was to in their actions and in their writings, to speak to the, the future and to make oh, I love it that they are involved in somewhat universal and somewhat memorable. And then for 50 years, forget about it, until Lincoln came up with You Cannot Escape History. Then we had another thing that, and then we're hiding again. Yeah. And then we're getting out again. But this was a period when they were really, uh, they weren't afraid to speak out and speak up. Well, what's, and what's extraordinary, what we've heard today, thanks to Francis, is that Thomas Paine's words are so relevant today. This is, this can be the age of Paine, that he hasn't lost it. And so I feel pretty comfortable asking someone to speak his words. Um, you know, it, it's not exactly Paine, but can I get away with that guy? What do you think? What, what was your impression? Were you off-put? No, yes, no. You got to direct him, though. That's 
He's a little bit too real and too physical. Well, he's a the theatrical actor. I don't think that's going to suit. The bug? I think you're going to have to watch him. He's going to try to raise it to... Well, often, in my experience, theatrical actors are much more, you know, you have to project and you have to do a lot more because you only have this little stage and the audience is out there. On film, you're in there with them, and so if you overdo it, it you're right. Well, I know. Well, we'll see. It's it's a work in progress, and we're in the earliest stages. Yes. Oh well, wouldn't he though? Wouldn't he though? I hate to admit it, but these fellows were kept saying it's it's not the person, it's the words. And I'm watching that clip, and I'm thinking they just said that, but this guy is so unsympathetic. Oh well, okay. If that's your if that's your feeling, I wonder if over the course of 90 minutes you can take someone and make him become Maybe. sympathetic because of the words. That's an exercise you I have like yet to angry, do. Angry person. <coughs> uh -huh. I, think, I think Thomas Paine would be more humble than the person that's portraying him. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Person. Yeah. You know, I always writer. said that he was the most wonderful um, conversationalist. I mean, not only was he a great writer, but people, through all his life, once they listened to him, he was fascinating, and yet he wasn't um, coarse or loud or um, <laughs> so that I don't know that that man captures that. The yeah. other thing to remember is that Luxembourg was actually kind of a social place. You know, people were crowded together, they had roommates and cellmates. Well, I don't and believe Payne had a cellmate. Oh yeah, he always had a cellmate. He had first he had really? one cellmate whom he didn't he have some friends in there or something? Well he had two. Well, first he had one cellmate whom he was afraid to um, they were afraid to speak out loud, so they would pass notes to each other saying bad things about Robespierre. <laughs> and then later, he had to testify because that man was um, arrested as some kind of a um, spy or something like that. So Payne testified in his defense. And then when Payne got ill... Actually, in, in the same cell. cell. Yeah, and then he was moved in with uh, three Belgians who cared for him when he was ill. So, and there's a lot of talk about him interacting with British prisoners. So I thought the I inter could use that, but it, that's not the whole experience. I understand. I, I thought the interaction, my understanding was that it took place, well, when cell doors were open and a few things. No, they had cellmates, yeah. Okay, very interesting. Thank you. Yes? Excuse me, no matter how much all the people in this room want to idealize this man, he still would have been covered with bugs in that uh, little cell <laughs> door. <laughs> I think there's actually, uh, Monroe had to help him uh, D. Flea and everything else. He was not the best house guest to receive. Yes? Also, I would imagine that a normal uh, course of emotion would certainly be anger if you're in prison, prison unjustly. Yeah. Well, I, I, I'm hoping that that will be mitigated. But I, I'm taking all of this to heart. It's fascinating. I'll do stuff with what you're saying. But one of the things I haven't told, for example, a bookend at the beginning and the end of the film, the way he was uh, lauded in church, we know of, of uh, ministers in various churches from all throughout New England would read Common Sense to the congregation and we're going to have a scene very early on of that and show the excitement over that and then at the end when they're demonizing him and saying that you know he's the scum of the earth and, and an infidel um, that will give you a little <laughs> bit of a scope of his life as well. Yes? You know, one of the details that I found really interesting was the French expert was the fact that he said before that time, the things were written just for the educated and, the, and this. If that's at all true, although oh. Benjamin Franklin was producing, if that's at all true about him, that's really something. Oh, it's absolutely true. In fact, as a writer, it's one of my favorite themes, and it goes to the same, it speaks to the same thing that Eric Foner is talking about, history from below. I have literary historians who've taught me a lot about this. He, he wrote for people. He, he was single-handedly responsible for an increase in literacy in America that is absolutely astounding because people wanted to read common sense. And they had it read aloud. The, t the main social network were coffee houses and taverns. And Paine did a lot of his writing in, in taverns and coffee houses, not because he was there to get drunk, but because that was where you went for your social life and your connection to the world was that's how you learned about people who just got off a ship or you learn, you know, the, the packet came with the ship and you got people reading mail and reading aloud bits. They, that's the only way they found stuff out. So 
he was writing for those people and his work would be read aloud to those who couldn't read and then they wanted to learn to read and they would gradually teach themselves to read because of, of pain and the statistics of literacy from before the revolution to afterwards, it's fascinating. And it's the coffee house and the tavern where all this happened. I mean, look at the sentences. I mean, just comparing like his pieces of writing for the Pennsylvania Magazine that were in the exercise office before that. And then it comes, there's actually, you know, a change in the style because the sentences become shorter and clearer. And when you compare something like that with, say, someone like, um, you know, Jefferson writing the summary rights of British America, and he's, you know, he's, he's making some of the similar arguments to pain, but that, you know, the sentences are long, they're both, he's got like one clause after another after another. There's one sentence in there that actually takes like an entire paragraph. <laughs> you have like, um, there's Major John Carter, who was also writing before the, the American Revolution. He was writing the same year as Jefferson, 1774. And what's funny about that, he uses some of the same sort of themes and tropes as Penn. He talks about it in the sort of the, the mother child relationship. That's sort of the same sort of comparisons that, you know, well, look, Britain is, you know, 3,000 miles from America, so why on earth are we governing? But again, the, you know, the, the pro style is just so different. Well, Payne, Payne never quoted Latin or Greek. Mm -hmm. One mm -hmm. thing that was quite typical of people, especially in America, because they wanted to show that they were still as they were as refined oh, yes. as the British yes. and as educated. <coughs> therefore, they would write for the educated. But they would include all these Greek and Latin phrases and references. Payne's references were exclusively either the Bible or reference to scientists mm -hmm. who had a proof that led to the idea of nature's God and man's rights are. We're born with them. Yes. I'm just sure aware that you can get all ten volumes of his life and writings on the web. In his own words. Yes. There's no shortage of information. And one of the concerns I have about the focus on uh, the prison is that it leaves out what he did when he came back to the United States. Well, that's a, I have a time shift. You do. I, I have they, to go they, to the cover life. You know, I can't it, ignore that. As a veteran, uh, you know, veterans of peace, his too peaceful accomplishment was writing the Maritime Compact which is proposed to the United Nations. Yes, oh, it's essential. And then the Louisiana Purchase, which he, on Christmas Day in 1802, wrote a letter to Jefferson on how to peacefully acquire the territory. It was brilliant. Double the size. Yeah, so these are not minor accomplishments. No, they're huge. I'm, and actually, this French uh, expert speaks to the Louisiana, so do all the experts. But yes, the Louisiana Purchase is, is very big his return to America, agrarian justice, where he, you know, basically talking about redistribution of wealth, social security, this is where it all began, the senior citizens. It's uh, quite amazing what he recommended. I think that's how he got to be so popular, because this was someone who knew how to write for the common and understood their concerns. I think that's the biggest thing. Because you have other people like Godwin, who are also writing about the same things as Payne, and in some ways gets into even more detail, but he doesn't have quite that touch. Well, I think he's a poor writer, or anything, but he doesn't have the same touch that he The has. fact that I would imagine your students may be saying it, but I know Ward Regan has said, and many history professors say, the students say, well, was this edited so we could understand it? Because they've had to read other ancient texts, and they're really hard to read, and Payne is just plain easier to read. I wanted to speak to your idea, your thinking about, you know, Payne's uh, more kinder, gentler side. Um, I've found some letters at the American Philosophical Society in Philadelphia. Um, one of the Gimbel brothers from the department store, he got to be, he was a Payne collector, and he found things, letters all over the world, and they're collected, and they were collected after a bulk of the history, including Foner's work, um, so that they haven't been included everywhere. And when you read them, it talks about his later years. When he was accused of being bitter and excluded and just a relic, well, he was actually very active. And I found documentation of he lived in New Rochelle. He stayed in New York frequently. But he often traveled across Connecticut, quite a journey, to Stonington, which is right on the Rhode Island border, and stayed with a Unitarian minister there because that Unitarian minister was tutoring young Thomas Paine, the son of Madame Bonneville, and he traveled with the boy and lived there while the boy was studying and had great conversations. Exactly, I can imagine like a salon, people would probably gather oh, Paines in town, you know, and let's go have a good conversation. So he, in his later years, there was stuff going on, and yes, I very much want to get to that, and I'll just have to, you know, start in prison and end up 
shifting time. Uh, I, it's a work in progress. Is that the one with the West Point? Yeah. Yes. Yes. I don't know which of the sons. Okay. Thomas became a soldier, a sailor, and soldier as well, but not as an officer. Okay. You know, to go to the, the sense of reality, you know, trying to capture this in a realistic way, did you see the, the series on um, Native Americans that was yes. on PBS? The one that was about the Mayflower, and I think Ken Burns was involved with that, was he? Uh, no, no. There were uh, uh, actually there were a number of Native American did directors. Not, not, not all of them. There was maybe a, I'm, I'm confusing them, but one of them was so stunning in that it was this reenactment of something from another time, but it was so real. Actually, was we've so well. we've watched that and rewatched that because I think it's one I of the better. I like that. I handed to that was American Experience. I don't know if you saw it, but it's really worth. Uh, you can you can still watch it and. It's not just a, a good rendition of history, but it's an interesting effort on the part of filmmakers trying to, they really used Native Americans' input and talent and participation, which authenticated it, but they also, they made it as real as they could. And sometimes you can see, yes, this is a modern filming of an old thing, but a lot of times it worked very well. It was beautifully done. Mm -hmm. And it had a lot of elegiac, emotional, visual moments. It wasn't just content which I hope we can do. Mm -hmm. Okay, time for one more question before we close up for the day. They may be all done. <laughs> well, I can't wait to see this. And you know, this is really exciting because Trevor Griffiths has a new, uh, you know, a new play out. A new I play. know. <laughs> He's been trying to make that film for years. He wants to to direct it. I know. What, what is Trevor Griffiths is a British screenwriter and he wanted Attenborough to direct a film on Thomas Paine and he's had a screenplay for years and then finally last year he did a um, radio play of his screenplay on the BBC and then that led to it being put on at the Globe Theatre this fall, this past fall and um, it, and it's been a, an exciting, uh, you know, a dramatic representation of Thomas Paine and Rumor has it that maybe HBO might go down that road, having had the biggest bestseller of their DVD documentary life with John Adams. But I, look, I, I feared they would lionize John Adams and they showed him with a lot of warts. So I thought, I was a little tired of the tilted angle after a while. <laughs> but um, I thought they did a fairly good job because I expected far worse. What I fear with Thomas Paine is I know that some of the complaints about Trevor's script have been that he made the affair with Madame Vonneville quite overt. You know, you always want to find where, okay, just cherche la femme, where's the sex? Yeah, Harvey, I think, towards the beginning. I think I would say about that, I think he really does capture Payne's spirit and passion. Reviews and said that. That's kind of the most important. Well, that, that is. And it'll get you you know, there's not too much pain. You can't have. There's not yes, been exactly. enough. So I hope. I hope it all. And anyway, mine's going to take years. You just. It's a long slog to do something like this because you can't afford to do it without enormous money. And you apply for a grant, you don't even hear about it for another six months. Well, hopefully, it won't take you 20 years. Like no, it won't take 20. But it could. It, I'm sort of aiming on paper for 2012. But I'm. Oh, I'm going to read you something from one of my. Um, grant proposal just because it, it speaks to what you said about uh, when you when you read um, ab about pain the first time you I knew you were thinking gee this should be a film and um, it's just just one paragraph but uh, after all pain was a revolutionary brimming with passion, turmoil, conflict, controversy. He was a man of superlatives, grandiose failures, tragic losses, unprecedented successes, loved and hated by multitudes, nearly killed countless times. He caught typhus on shipboard on his way to America. He was nearly beaten to death in Philadelphia. He fought the British in key revolutionary battles. He barely escaped the gallows in England by fleeing to France. He was to be, he he was to be beheaded in France, but prison guards miraculously overlooked him. He returned to America where he hoped to find peace, but his religious views turned many against him. Ministers called him the devil incarnate. His bones were stolen from his grave. And in the midst of all that, he wrote the three top-selling books of the 18th century. <laughs> <laughs> and you also in 